Thank you. You hear me okay? It's an honor to be here. 45 years ago, Denton Cooley and Mike DeBakey welcomed this crazy physiologist from Seattle. So at that time, this building was a mud flat, most of UT, so there's been quite an evolution. Thanks for having me. Uh, the PET team have listed, and we call it the Weatherhead Pet Center for Preventing and Reversing. Now, you can't reverse and prevent something unless you know that it's safe to do so before you might miss somebody that would die that would survive with invasive procedures first. So good prevention means you also have to deal with the invasive part of it, and then also the prevention part, and then the technology that's necessary. Now, most cardiologists that classify themselves as an echo person, a pet person, a spec person, an invasive cardiologist, or prevention, but uh, the issue is really not to be labeled as a methodologic proceduralist, but to measure the basic fundamental coronary physiology, which is why I came 45 years ago and began what I hope has become a fundamental subspecialty of coronary pathophysiology. No matter what your tools are, you just have to know how to measure them and what it means. This was possible by Alan C. Weatherhead that established an endowment and a foundation. This is the team. There are 25 people, five cardiologists, three nurses, three technologists, three statisticians, three computer people. Uh, they do it. Uh, I can just look at pictures and then figure out maybe a little bit of physiology. So that's where we're going. But the evolution is important, like the medical center, biological evolution and technology evolution to go together. So in order to avoid the label of being a pet imager, we're going to start at the beginning, the physiology. So in 1972, I did the first experiment on the Seattle afternoon, putting a flow meter on this artery of a canine model and a stenoser, injected a contrast media, which was very hypermolar then and caused tremendous reactive hyperemia. And what I noticed in the very first experiment that normally flow went up four times when you caused hyperemia, you put on a stenosis and it would not rise, but rest flow was the same. I call this coronary flow reserve that characterized the first physiologic stenosis severity and realized uh, that when you reduced flow reserve, it told you about the physiologic severity and that changed the rest of my life. And that's why I'm here. And it was the first correlation of a precisely measured stenosis with the flow. That was the first step. Second step was next year where we put in tiny little catheters that I developed into the distal coronary and also the proximal coronary and chronic animals. And they grew up and we took angiograms when they're awake. And what happened was that flow goes up normally and there's no pressure gradient. But when you put on a stenosis, the flow is limited, but the pressure gradient's tremendous. So the flow falls. And so the next major step was to relate flow versus pressure. And they follow this quadratic equation. <clears throat> and that quadratic equation is actually related to a formula. And that triggered my physics excitement because the pressure loss could be defined by the viscous loss in the narrow part and vortex shedding, both uh, proportional to the radius to the fourth power and the radius of the normal artery of force power. So we had an absolute measure of what the anatomy was. And that equation is now the basis of all the simulations, FFR, CT, QFR, and so on. It's all came from there and was proved back then experimentally. That was a big step, but it wasn't the end. So in 78, what it dawned on me is that pressure flow wasn't enough. You can measure any epicardial measurement in the cath lab or experimentally, but it misses something. And there was no CT scans of then. They didn't exist. There were no PET scans. I knew this had to be true physiologically, so we did the next best thing, an experimental model. You do the, do the injection of thallium with the flows and the stenosis, sacrifice the heart, take it out, and lace cuts of the heart, tomographic cuts on top of a gamma camera, and lo and behold, what you saw was subendocardial underperfusion or the transmural perfusion gradient. Why is that important? Because it is a marker of pressure. 
When your pressure falls, you can't perfuse the subliminal cardium. And yet we could do this non-invasively in 78. Well, invasively, pretty invasive, sacrifice the animal. But it took then until 1978 when we flew to LA with the, the models chronically instrumented. And then the first PET scanner where in vivo, this is the chronic instrumentation, the flow meter, the stenosis. We took a picture in vivo of a stenosis that was mild and lo and behold, the subliminal cardium falls. There's decrease in epicardial flow too, but it's mainly subliminal cardium. And that fit the model from the experimental model where you lost the subliminal cardium here and you had this rim of subhepicardium alive. So this tells us about pressure. So the three big steps are there. So that's why I came to Texas, because it didn't work. If you took percent diameter narrowing in the flow reserve in the animal model, clearly there is a limit. And the critical range, and now used in the cath lab, is 75 to 80% diameter stenosis, flow reserve of two, is correct for the animal model. It's been degraded a little bit to say 50% stenosis, but that's not critical. That's a little exaggeration on the invasive team. Why didn't it work? Because in the first experiment with Mel Marcus in Iowa, he put doppers on open chest, people going to cabbage for a three vessel disease, and the normal arteries had high flows. But where there was a stenosis, there was no correlation between coronary flow reserve and coronary artery diameter stenosis. Didn't work. That means there was diffuse disease and the transmittal gradient wasn't accounted for. So that is then the second reason, the real reason I came to Texas to address that problem. So we built the first whole heart PET scanner, multi-scanner, a group of engineers, 23 of them, and built this thing, made it work, uh, figured out how to do the flows, and developed what's called the simple model. So if you look at arterial input here, and you look at myocardial uptake flows determined by the cumulative activity divided into myocardial activity, this simple little equation down here, myocardium divided the arterial input function, that is to say the time activity arterial curve, and you have to correct it for myocardial extraction, but that's okay. But it's complicated, and if you try to do this on a pixel basis, it's a mess. So we developed a model in which we would get better arterial input functions over a period of two minutes instead of instantaneous curves. And that turned out to be the basis for this fantastic correlation that nobody's been able to reproduce using time activity curves to date. So we loop, jump ahead a few years. Now we have a heart, instead of one artery, one flow, and one pressure that doesn't work, now we have 340, 1344 pixels in every piece of the heart. And we measure both CFR and stress flow in cc's per minute. And for each pixel, and that's a lot of data, nobody can read that on an image. So we back projected onto this map of young volunteers, people with risk factors but no disease, disease but no symptoms, and then ischemic changes on EKG or angina. So now we can categorize this enormous number of data on clinical categories, recolor the pixels, project them back into where they came from, and now we have a three-dimensional map of all the measurements in the heart that you can make. So what does it tell you? Red is really good, orange is not so bad, yellow is diffuse, and green and blue are bad. So here we have a case. We see that the distal part of the LAD is diffuse disease. It increases, but not good. Uh, proximal, it's bad. That means that he's got an open lemma with proximal progressive disease. He's got an occluded circumflex in the right of collaterals because it's viable in steels. And so here's the angiograms to prove it. So this all of a sudden tells you then from one artery, one stenosis, one pressure, we have the complete picture of every branch in the heart on a pixel basis. You can assume where the LAD is like in the 17th Heart Association or take the LAD and take that general area, but it won't tell you what each individual artery has done 
And that's what tells the invasive cardiologist what to do or whether we can do prevention and defer the procedures. So how does it work? So if you do this coronary flow capacity map that combines the stress flow and the CFR per pixel, if you look like this, with either big blue, big blue plus a big border zone of moderate to severe, and then a big area of risk with a part of it that's severe, what happens to you is that you have a 50-year MACE rate, a 50% MACE rate in 10 years. That's very high. If on the other hand, you have diffuse disease, it's not so severe by the specific criteria of flow reserve of 1.3 or 0.8 cc's per minute per gram. That threshold defines who lives and who dies. And it's quite sharp. So then the question is, what do you do about it? But let's say why that might be true. Why does coronary flow capacity work better than coronary flow reserve or global measurements? And here's the answer. You can have high flow at rest and high flow at stress. Because the rest flow is so high, your coronary flow reserve is terrible. But when you put them together in a map, the coronary flow reserve map tells you, CFC map tells you it's okay. Now here's low rest flow and low stress flow because you got disease on a beta blocker, stress flow is down, but so is rest flow. But now you have a very high coronary flow reserve and it looks great, but it doesn't tell you quite what's going on. It tells you that the coronary flow capacity is normal, got diffuse disease, but can increase flow, low risk. Here, you have very heterogeneous rest flow, which is common. So you got high flow rest here, low flow rest here, the uniform stress flow. But since this is high and this is standard, you get a defect. Whereas this low rest flow and this stress flow gives you a high flow reserve. And it's misleading. This would be a defect on standard images. That's a fake. It's false because the rest flow is so heterogeneous, but you put them in the coronary flow capacity map and you can see it's diffuse disease without a segmental section that gets better. Now, many people say, okay, well, let's just use the LAD distribution, the circumflexion right measure flow. Does it help you? No, here's high flow in that LAD distribution and there's low flow. You don't know the global is okay, but you got disease in a great big diagonal, you can't see it. Uh, so basically this, regional arbitrary placement of flow measurements doesn't work. Here's a 17 heart segment association model. And look, here's high flow. In the border, it's low flow. Here's one on the border. So you can't tell actually what arteries involved. You can say generally, well, maybe this is the LAD, but why is the anterior wall out? And the anterior wall is out because there's a big diagonal you can't see for sure. So the regional external ROIs hurt you, not help you. And then here's one with average global flow of three. That's great, you see that, we're gonna live forever. But look what the stress flow does in the uh, circumflex and right distribution. You miss it, global flows are useless. But you look at now global flow is reduced, it's pretty bad. But what it obscures is that you have a lethal LAD, your circumflex and rights open, so again, the global flow doesn't tell you. But if you look at these coronary flow capacity maps per pixel, this is eight minutes, 15 minutes difference day. It's absolutely reproducible. This is the Komorov Smirnoff test where you look at the histogram distribution of all the colors, the colors, colors here and percent of LV here. And they're all reproducible. So you overcome this heterogeneity problem and we've been challenged that 3D is too sensitive, you can't do that. Well, we got two 3D models now, the most expensive ones I could find, too expensive. And the 3D flows and the 2D flows by classical PET are identical. So why does coronary flow capacity work? It's a physiologic question, and actually an evolutionary question. So this is death in my stroke mace for size of defect in the LV. And so the purple and the orange lines are the size increasing death with size for either size of stress flow or size of coronary flow reserve separately. But when you add them up and take both, you have a 30% higher mortality. Why is that? 
It's because you can have a low resting flow and a high flow reserve and you do okay, or if you have the reverse. So the individual measurements predict events, but when they both go down, you go down. And so measuring all the components of the physiology is required to understand what happens, not just flow reserve alone or not just stress alone. So the evolution over the 50 years goes from one artery, one flow, one pressure, to the modern world where we have the machine instead of the flow meter. We get the pixel data instead of one artery, and it shows that if this is death, and this is size of defect blue, when you have big blue, it's up over 25%, you go down often. And if you revascularize it in non-randomized trials, you improve survival by over 50%. Is that the end? It's just the beginning. Why? Because these are the epicardial arteries that you know. This is an angiogram. Diffuse disease, microvascular disease, stenosis. But here's the real information. It's in this dense bed of flow. And it's the dense bed of flow where the muscle works or not that kills you. Now you say, okay, well, the flow is up here. This is bad. That's not true. Not always. You have to differentiate those. And there's an evolutionary reason for that. You know, you can pump a lot of blood over a lifetime. And this marvelous pump feeds its own blood supply. It pumps 60 million gallons of blood. What is that? That's a, a pool of blood 10 feet wide, 10 feet deep, a mile and a half long. And it never stops. How does it do that? Because during diastole, you get flow. And during diastole, you get flow that's all the way through the wall. Then systole, it squeezes off the subendocardium. The subepicardium still gets something. So that during systole, the flow stops. But during diastole, it shoots up and you get pressure. Now, and you get coronary blood flow. Now, remember, pressure determines the transmural perfusion gradient. So how does that fit in? Well, here's a good flow and good subendocardial perfusion. Everything's okay. Now there is diffusely reduced flow, not bad, not blue, but with high flows, you shell out the subendocardium because, you know, like FFR, when you increase the flow, the pressure falls. Well, the marker of that falling pressure in the PET scan is subendocardial underperfusion. Now, this is microvascular disease where the flow limit increase is limited by the microvascular disease. You never get enough flow to drop the pressure, so your subendocardium is normal. So this is the senicronon, the definitive definition between diffuse epicardial disease and microvascular disease. Look at the subendocardial flow, and then you got stenosis out here. So in a sense, the physiology measured by a good PET scan tells you about flow, pressure, and what's happening to the heart. Why is that? This is a great experimental study in which uh, flow is measured in microspheres and you drop the pressure but maintain flow. So the epicardial flow, flow with coronary pressure is maintained until you're already down coronary pressure at 25. But the subendocardium flow starts to fall at a pressure of 35. Experiments. Now, one reason for that is that if you do an experimental model and you measure the microspheres, the early flow after a 90-second inclusion, the subepicardial flow recovers very quickly. But the subendocardial flow is delayed by 20 seconds. And so the average transmural flow comes back, but slowly. That means that the subendocardium is very sensitive to heart rate and pressure. How sensitive? So we can measure that on a PET scan by looking at radial activity. You plot the radial activity against distance from the center of the heart. And the blue is in diastole, the red is in systole. You immediately say that if there's diffuse disease, you drop your subendocardial perfusion tremendously. The subepicardial perfusion, not so much different. So here's a severe stenosis. It goes transmural. This is moderate stenosis and diffuse disease, you lose it at the apex, you have diffuse subendocardial underperfusion, you need to fix it because it'll die with a high risk. This is diffuse disease without a stenosis, 
They do quite well on medical therapy. Intervention and bypass stents don't help. This is very high flow with LVH, and we know that with LVH, you can't perfuse a subunocardium. That's why you get these strange EKG changes on an LVH EKG. And then this is microvascular disease. It can be severe, where the flow is limited by the microvascular disease, so you never drop your pressure, and therefore your endocardial flow is okay. And then we see some like this. A young woman with a bad angina, but really high flow. Extraordinary flows, three cc's per minute per gram. A little mild decrease in FFR by PET. So she's got angina, so we recognize, okay, there's a mild LAD lesion, very high flow, causes angina. There's the mild subunocardial LAD washout. This deserves a stent, even though it's low risk for death, got symptoms, fix it. And so it goes away and it turns back to normal. So what does this mean in terms of the larger issue measuring subunocardial perfusion? This is MACE. This is percent of the heart with different kinds of severities. This is big and blue. We know that if you're big and blue, you don't do well. Your survival is down. Your average uh, MACE is 44% in uh, 10 years. Now, what about subunocardial underperfusion in the black lines? The two dash dot black lines are different kind of measures of quantitative subunocardial underperfusion. So in our population, this here it's 6,000, now it's 12,000. Most patients, 70% of all patients, have some mild subunocardial underperfusion, even those with just risk factors. And that's because this is the physiologic picture of what you see on IBUS. Everybody has atherosclerosis, so to speak, at least when they get to us. Uh, on the other hand, not many have angina. I'll show you in a minute. Now, the gray line is PET FFR. Remember, FFR was proven by PET in the first place. So PET is the most accurate measure of FFR, where you can get FFR for different sizes of the ventricle, and you can see that it increases some, but it never really gets up to where we are up here. Now then, this is a remarkable picture that is, remains fascinating to me and what we're working on. This is the percent of patients with angina or SD depression. Look at the blue line, bad disease. Less than half have any angina at all. So the ACC guidelines that you don't do procedures to people with angina, this is a lot of people. And so we fly by the seat of our pants and, and do procedures anyway, but which ones? Now, this down here means that while many people have mild subunocardial underperfusion, only 9 to 12 percent have angina. Not everybody with subunocardial perfusion gets angina. Small number, small percent, actually. So the question is, what causes angina? And with bad ischemia, Dr. Narula has the hypothesis that the ischemia kills the nerves. You can't feel anything. Uh, and we're going to start doing some neural imaging to examine that. On the other hand, these people don't have much ischemia. It's not so bad. But they have a different kind of stress in the wall. And so the question is, does wall stress and distortion of the uh, tension across the wall, does that trigger mechanical receptors that produce some angina and some people are not? And so we got to study that. That's what's coming. So now let's just look at some examples and then take this still a next step further. This patient was referred for bypass surgery with 80% stenosis of all coronary arteries. I don't see too much of this anymore, but enough, too much. And so even the surgeon didn't think this was real. So we did a PET scan. It's normal except for a little diffuse disease at the apex. And that's because the estimate, the, 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 the severity was overestimated if you actually measure them at 30 PC percent diameter. So this is the model. This is 33%. That looks about like this. When you get up to 80, 90% stenosis, you can hardly see it. An angiogram can't really resolve a 90% stenosis. Just can't do it. So when it looks like this, that's what it's like. This would be an 80% stenosis. You can barely see it. And so basically, the estimates by angiogram have really failed. And they failed because diameter stenosis doesn't make any difference anyway. And the flows of function are fourth power, 
And there's no angiogram, no matter how good, that can predict that, including FFRCT, which is the worst. So what's the consequence? Well, if you have acute disease, you know that you've got something severe, fix it, and you do better. So your survival is better. On the other hand, uh, the STITCH trial didn't show any benefit with respect to ischemia, not too surprising. Curtis trial showed no benefit in elective disease. The ischemia trial so didn't show any benefit. Why is that? Is it because they were all angiogram driven? Or was it FFR not measured? Well, remember FFR is the ratio of coronary pressure to aortic pressure. It's a relative coronary flow reserve, not absolute numbers. And uh, Nico Pills came from uh, Alst in the Netherlands and got his equation straight with us. And I'm the senior author on this fractional flow reserve paper. You know, this is 1993. It took that many years, 35 years, to get pressure on the physiology map. Did it serve a purpose? It said that you could defer, but it did not show that it improved mortality. So now 2019, still more years later, uh, systematic meta-analysis showed that there is a signal for decreasing um, MIs by FFR-guided PCI, not mortality, and none of the individual FAME trials, but only a meta-analysis. But it's a clue. It's a clue. So fractional flow reserve then that came out of my lab has been important, but like percent stenosis, it's also wrong because the threshold is too high, and I'll show you why. So this is published data from Ahn and uh, Nils Johnson from our place. Big numbers, and if you plot FFR against MACE, you see the deferred ones have a blue line, the ones you intervene on have the red line. And if you've got a really low FFR, you've got some potential benefit in both independent series of studies. But above this threshold, actually doing the procedures causes harm, which is reasonable. There's some risk of the procedures, and that risk is worse than the natural course of disease. But notice that the threshold is very low at the actual crossover point. But given the scatter, you actually have to look at FFR as a less than 0.6 based on published FFR pressure data. Is there an experimental basis? This was Smalling. He took dogs and lowered the pressure to 38, FFR 4.3, and measured the circumferential uh, contraction. No change. Interesting. Does that apply to humans? Seiler, uh, Seiler that spent with me, uh, Christian Seiler, spent three years with me, went to be chief cardiologist at Geneva. Uh, he was a mountain marathon skier. You gotta be crazy to do that, but he did it. So he went in the lab and had him blow up a balloon as LAD and measure how long it took him to get ischemia and ST change. Then he convinced a bunch of his buddies to do the same. And they discovered something profoundly important that you don't get ischemia or ST change until your coronary pressure is 35, just like Smalling, just like this. So this low pressure is reflected in the subunocardial perfusion, but in itself, the threshold that we use now has nothing to do with physiology. It's a result of a hodgepodge in the FAME trials of how they define what FFR was supposed to mean. So let's solidify that a little bit. This is the original paper from uh, Nico Pills and Bernard in which they measured pressure FFR against relative flow reserve by PET, and it's a straight line. There are three other papers that confirm it. So now let's go back and say, this is plot of the percent size for a given FFR 0.7, and then the CFC. So blue is bad, gets better to fix it. If you look at the FFR by size, it doesn't increase, no more death. You look at 0.6, and all of a sudden you're starting to get increased death, and if you six it, you do get a, a better survival. If you get down to 0.5, all of a sudden you get a pretty high risk for FFR of less than 0.5 that increases the size, and if you fix it, you get better survival. But it doesn't approach the absolute measurements because remember, FFR is a relative measure. You can have high flow and a big FFR and no ischemia, 
So it doesn't really tell you about death, although when it gets so low, it's starting to give you the signal. So what we arrived at is that if you got big bleds, bad blues, coronary flow capacity, you got very high at risk. And if you do something, revascularize, it gets better. But it doesn't come back to normal. That means there's a lot of residual disease. Well, we need to be able to predict that in order to know should we do this or not. That's the next question. So we did a randomized entry trial, and I'll show you the answer. Uh, it was randomized, uh, 1,000 patients roughly, and they're equally divided, and they had PET imaging after randomization. And uh, the control, the standard group, the PET was blinded. Unless you had big, bad, and blue, we had to break the blind because I'm not gonna send somebody to preventive therapy when I know they got a risk that high. Uh, the, the, the comprehensive group was unblinded and we put them on a very intensive treatment program. So if you look like this, you got medical treatment. If you look like this, you got intervention in both groups. So in a sense, if you intervene on the control group, you make things worse for the trial because you are left only with medical treatment for bad disease. And so the question is, if you can get a better outcome doing that, it means that it's even more powerful than they make. And what would be the role of PET? So here's the, the first uh, endpoint was risk scores that combine all the risk that you can think of in a big score. At baseline, they're the same. So this is a histogram distribution. The lower the risk score, the better you're off. The higher the risk score, the more you die. So at baseline, they're the same. At the end of five years, the treatment group shifted left. Lower risk, the, compre the, uh, the, the comprehensive group, the standard group moved to the right. And the difference is highly significant. Not big, but it adds up with all these different risk factors. So what's the result? In the comprehensive group, the death rate was cut in half compared to the standard group. Death or MI was cut by 30%. Revascularization is cut by 30%. MAKE is cut by 30%. So it's the first strategy trial using interventions in which has been improved in all three endpoints. And if you do Captain Meyer plots uh, or you do Cox regression modeling for these groups or you do, uh, these are Captain Meyer, these are Cox modeling, uh, you get a significant improvement in each group. Now, what's interesting, we followed up for another up to 10 years, actually up to 11 years afterwards, and you see the curves continue to diverge. Now, people are more dying because they're getting older, but the curves are continuing to divide, diverge, meaning that the comprehensive group carries over. Some of them continued, but it had a benefit, and that includes the crossovers where a guy in the comprehensive group didn't do anything, and the guy in the standard group said, well, I'm going to beat you guys, I'm gonna fix it myself. Uh, so despite the crossovers, there's a big difference by either Captain Meyer or Cox. So what good did PET do? Interesting. If you had no severe coronary flow capacity, very few got revascularized out of the whole group. If you had severe, a third, 28%, 30% got revascularized, and then there was a group that didn't. So did the flows play a role? No. The comprehensive group, this is the uh, Kolmogorov, uh, uh, Smirnoff uh, comparison of the histogram distribution and the comprehensive care in the group at baseline in the five years, and there's no difference. Flows didn't change. Well, why did they live longer? Because that's what plaque stabilization does. And so then why, what role did the PET have? Well, that's quite interesting. The ones that had, did not get revascularized had much smaller defects, much less angina, much less ST, and less diffuse disease. So by looking at the PET when it was bad, the participating docs decided, given the symptoms, 
that they would do less invasive procedures. So the PET served to read, weed out a lot of unnecessary procedures and reinforce the docs and the patients that they were at low risk and could do uh, non-invasive treatment. And then a few of them during it kind of progressed, so they got their procedures. And so the PET role was to assure that we could do reversal treatment, <laughs> medical treatment, but also to pick up the severe ones where it does make a difference. And the difference in size and symptoms is a clue to that the participating docs were interacting with the physiology to make the right decisions. Now, what about those that did get uh, revascularized? The blue is a histogram distribution percent of the LV with all the different color severity. And they're bad when they start. And when they got their revascularization, they got better. The PET scans got better. It was significant. But that betterness never reached the ones that didn't have severity that required a revascularization in the first place. So it means that when you have a procedure and you're bad, you have a lot of disease left over. Now, could we predict that? We did. This is a virtual prediction of the survival probability. This was the actually observed at five years in this group of people versus what we predicted by eliminating all the big bad blue part of the PET scan and re-predicting what it would get. So this is our virtual prediction. This is reserved for those that didn't get revascularized. They had very low risk to begin with, and so it didn't change. So these are examples of predictions. This is bad gets better. We predicted at 90. Observer 92, we predicted 88. On the other hand, it doesn't always get better. Bad, you got bypassed, they missed some stuff. So the, predict, the observed prediction survivability 10 years was not so good, not bad, and we predicted it right. Down here, we said don't operate on this guy. The surgeon did anyway, Now they don't do that much anymore, but they did then. And so after surgery, no change because he has microvascular and diffuse disease. We predicted no change, he had no change. And we predicted ahead of time. This one was in the kind of early days when uh, cowboys went and stented something that didn't need it, had good flow, stented it anyway. And then the stent took out a big branch and made it worse. That doesn't happen so much anymore. Uh, my invasive team has learned. So if you compare for all these different severities, the actual observed survival probability on a follow-up PET scan after procedure, uh, it matches the predicted pretty well. So now we can kind of tell in advance. And so this is the 7,000 patients. This is the before revascularization survival without, uh, without revascularization, bad disease. If you actually fix it, you get up here. And this is the virtual prediction average and high range that brackets the actual. So it's not perfect, but it gives you a, a sense of where we're going. So. The strategy of lifestyle medical prevention management guided with uh, PCI, but with, with chronic flow capacity to guide revascularization. It does work. It explains failure randomized trials to demonstrate improved survival because the entry criteria for these trials was very sloppy. It's an angiogram, maybe FFR, maybe, maybe a spec scan. Uh, and those aren't good enough to tell you the physiology and what's really interesting is that since the flows don't change, yet people live better, it really suggests plaque stabilization, which we know, but it's never been proved. And so then the psychological part is that if you have a PET scan that's not lethal, you can feel pretty secure in doing preventive treatment. If it looks like this, you got to fix it. And you fix it because if it gets bad, when you next have your plaque rupture, you'll go down. But you can find the disease early here. And so prevention is what you need up to the point where you have high risk. Then you got to do prevention and intervention. And this is how that works. So the evolution is pretty interesting. The mammalian heart, 200 million years ago, developed the capacity to increase flow, to escape your enemies and survive while the 
dinosaurs were chomping each other up. It took 50 million years for this little one inch long mammalian to get two feet long. It took another nearly 146 million years for the first hominid and then homo sapiens. And during that time, this survival physiology now tells us what to do. And how did we get here? Well, you know, about the Tuxedo Crater and the big asteroid that destroyed all of dinosaurs, and we grew out of it. So at 300,000 years ago, Homo sapiens, his first technology was a spear. Now we got the PET scan. It's all the same physiology. So in the past, the invasive cardiologist is king, what he says goes. But that doesn't really work. Coronary physiology is chasing invasive cardiology because invasive cardiology is a surgical procedure. The diagnosis in the cath lab is poor. It doesn't work. But when you look at the entire coronary pathophysiology, the king knows he's the king because he can fix it, but pathophysiology has to tell him what to fix and how. And so I'll end there. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we do have a way to go. Uh, that's not simple. It needs to be completely automated so that a kind of normal person, not my technologist, can do it. And a doc that doesn't know much about physiology because you're not trained that way can have a printout that says, if you do this procedure right in the PET scan, it will tell you what to do. And it will be evidence-based, and you'll seldom be wrong. I haven't quite got there yet, but give me another five years, and I'll come back and give you another grand rounds. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here.